Who would win in a fight? An age-old question that just about every nerdily inclined individual in the world has debated with their friends about at least once in their life. Whether it's Superman vs. Goku, Master Chief vs. Doom Guy, or any other of the practically infinite matchups pulled from a cross-fiction of all mediums, there seems to be nothing we love more than a good cross-universe dust-up. Dating back as far as I can remember, these debates raged on. Everywhere from the uncool table in middle school cafeterias, to late nights at a friend's sleepover when actually sleeping was off the menu, there was always a new matchup to discuss. And nowadays, with the advent of internet message boards, YouTube series like Death Battle, crossover fighting games like Smash Bros, Jump Force, and Mortal Kombat guest rosters, hell, even big Hollywood movies getting in on the action, the landscape of conversation for these hypothetical contests of strength is bigger and more intense than ever. And that's all well and good. Like I said, I've had my fair share of arguments over this stuff too. There's nothing wrong with occasionally shooting the shit with a buddy on a long car ride about how Gandalf would totally wipe the floor with Dumbledore or whatever you feel like talking about. But, uh, some of you guys... You take it too far. I'm referring specifically to the practice of power scaling. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it basically entails taking a fictional character, figuring out all of the most impressive things they've ever done, these are called feats, and attempting to use real world measurements, math and science, to figure out exactly how fast and strong said character is, as well as the effects of whatever special abilities they might have. More weight tends to be given to stuff that we actually see the character do, but sometimes things that are only alluded to are used as feats as well. Upon figuring all this stuff out, the character is usually given a power rating based on the results. A few different metrics are used, but the most common rating system is based on attack potency and durability. Essentially, what's the biggest thing they could destroy with a single attack, and what's the most powerful attack they could possibly endure without dying. This scale ranges from the infinitesimally small all the way up to boundless infinite strength. A similar scale is used for speed feats that ranges from immobile to massively faster than light. Once you've got your rating for both characters in the matchup, you simply compare the stats. With characters that are clearly in different leagues and have no business fighting each other, the match is considered a stomp. But otherwise, the debate typically starts with these things and progresses to comparisons of things like intelligence, skills, experience, equipment, character flaws, and theorizing about how certain unique powers might interact with one another. Eventually, hopefully, whoever is running the debate will decide a winner. If this all seems reasonable enough, if perhaps a bit dorky so far to you, then I would agree. But upon closer scrutiny, three fatal flaws in this methodology are made clear. With the first being, authors don't care about power scaling. No one writes with this stuff in mind. When a writer is constructing a scene, their priority and main focus is going to be on developing the characters, furthering the storyline, delivering on a cool action sequence, or in all likelihood, doing several of those at once. The concern is almost never going to be, how can I write this in such a way as to facilitate consistency and comparison of my character with those of another author? Like, what? It's hard enough to just make everything work within the logic of your own world and rules, and a lot of writers, even very skilled ones, will display some degree of inconsistency even when comparing characters within the same series or the same character between different scenes let alone having to scale it properly with everyone else's completely separate imaginary worlds and characters that operate on totally different rule sets. 99% of the time, a writer just wants to create an awesome, effective, emotionally compelling scene that will be satisfying to their own audience and within the context of their own story. And a lot of the time, a character doing something that makes for a cool visual is much more important for affecting the audience than a 100% adherence to consistency will be. A perfect example of this is a scene from part 6 of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Stone Ocean. The main character, Jolene, is trapped in a maximum security prison and a huge fight breaks out between her, the guards, and several other prisoners. And being that this is an anime, everyone involved has wacky superpowers. Jolene can manifest a powerful spectral figure called a stand to fight alongside her. She also has some cool other abilities that are tied to that but they aren't super relevant to this discussion. Her opponent, a prison guard named Westwood, has the power to call down small meteors from space to his location for use as projectiles. During the course of this fight, Jolene is about to be hit by one of these meteors and punches it away with her stand at the last second, destroying the meteors but breaking her hand in the process, since she also takes any damage done to her stand. Pretty badass, right? Makes for a thrilling moment in a high stakes fight. Now, given this scene, and without doing any further research, where on the aforementioned power scale would you place Jolene? Well, let's see what the professional power scalers over at Death Battle had to say about this. Just as strong as Stone Free, which can punch meteors that were pulled to Earth in seconds. By measuring the distance the meteors are from Earth, we can estimate they were moving at over 11 million meters per second. 
factoring in their mass, they'd each have a kinetic energy of 441 kilotons of TNT. What? Okay, how close was your guess? I was pretty fucking far off the mark. I mean, the conclusion they draw here is completely ridiculous. Even assuming that all of their math and measurements are correct, which I'm sure they are, if you genuinely think that Hirohiko Araki's intention with this scene was to say that Jolene's stand is capable of punching with the force of a small nuclear bomb, then you are insane! This is a prison break story, and we're clearly shown earlier on in the series that her stand, while being quite strong, about strong enough to bend a quarter in half with its fingers, is not quite powerful enough to break through the bars on Jolene's prison cell. Not to mention all the time throughout the series where she needs to unleash a barrage of attacks to finish a fight with opponents that have ordinary human durability. If she was actually intended to be as strong as this feat shows, then the entire rest of the series makes a lot less sense. Now, clearly, Araki wrote that scene because he thought it would be badass to have his protagonist punch a flaming meteor. And he was absolutely right, it was a very cool scene. But because it happened, it's now a feat, and power scalers will take this, apply a bunch of math and physics to something that never took those things into account in the first place, and use that to say a character is so-and-so level while ignoring all the other evidence to the contrary. And why would people do something like that? Because of the second major flaw. People want their favorite guy to win. Human beings are inherently biased creatures, it's just a fact of life. And fictional stories have an innate ability to connect to us on a deep and personal level. Our favorite characters are almost a part of us, and as such, we become very attached to them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when someone else comes along and says that a different character is stronger than our favorite guy, we don't like hearing that. It brings out the same primal childhood playground defensive need to insist that no, my dad could beat up your dad. Even if the other kid's dad is a black belt ex-Navy SEAL bodybuilder, it doesn't matter because I love my dad and I really, really want him to win. So when it comes to power scaling, the most popular characters tend to have the largest, staunchest defense squad ready to come out of the woodwork to provide any and every feat possible to ensure that they always come out on top no matter what. And for a perfect example of this phenomenon, we need look no further than the bat in the room. People love Batman. He is one of the most popular fictional characters of all time. Even among people who aren't into superheroes at all, Batman is a household name, and with good reason. With a rock-solid basic concept, decades of excellent comic book storylines, critically acclaimed feature films, a few banger video games, and several great animated TV shows under his utility belt, Batman is awesome. And I love Batman too. He's my second favorite superhero after Spider-Man. So fellow Bat fans, please don't take it the wrong way when I say that you're all annoying as hell. It comes from a place of love, I promise. But when you take the idea of authors writing scenes without any consideration for power scaling, and compound that over nearly a hundred years of continuous Batman content with dozens, probably hundreds of writers projecting their own preferences and limitations onto the character, each with their own tolerance for putting the rule of cool over consistency, and then you unleash all of that material to untold hordes of adoring fans who are more than happy to scour every bit of that material for something, anything to support their position in a given argument, and it's almost inevitable that people would come up with reasons that Batman could defeat well, just about any character given enough prep time, regardless of whether it actually makes any sense for Batman to win that fight. I mean, he's a very smart, very capable fighter, but he's still an unpowered human at the end of the day, and he routinely struggles against the mostly street-level characters in his rogues gallery. And yet, you will find fairly compelling arguments all over the internet for why he would defeat characters who, in all honesty, would vaporize him in the blink of an eye. Purely because he's been around for so long and writers have done so much with him as a character that you can find evidence for him pulling off pretty much anything you can imagine. And while Batman may be the most prominent example of this phenomenon, you can be sure that any character with a sufficiently large pool of source material and a devoted enough fanbase will have similar arguments made on their behalf when it comes to versus matchups. Arguments that selectively focus on outlier feats written without scaling in mind and used to vastly highball characters in spite of those arguments potentially going against the established limitations of said character. And this happens because we don't like seeing our favorites lose. Which brings me to the third and final nail in the coffin. Strength doesn't really matter. I mean, genuinely. 
Whether one character can beat another in a fight has absolutely nothing to do with how good of a character they are. I know there's a knee-jerk reaction to defend our favorites, but why? Sure, Superman could utterly demolish Spider-Man in a billion different ways, but that doesn't change the fact that I like Spider-Man more. And Goku isn't any deeper or more interesting than Guts from Berserk just because he'd win in a 1v1. Saitama isn't any better or more emotionally compelling than Aragorn, even if he does have an absurdly higher power level. We don't love a character because we've used pixel measurements and vague statements from some obscure source to determine that they're a massively faster than light, multiverse destroying, omnipotent god that can solo all of fiction. We love them because we've resonated with them on an emotional level because of good writing and compelling development, because we can identify with their struggles and have empathy for them like we would for a real person. Or maybe we just think they're funny or we dig their vibes. Their strengths certainly could factor into it as well, don't get me wrong. I know I love a good kick-ass finishing move as much as the next guy, but no matter what, it's all based on our emotional connection to them. Fiction is a realm of emotion. Facts may not care about your feelings in the real world, but in the domain of storytelling, the facts are entirely defined by them. Not to mention that any matchup between characters is just going to go in favor of whoever the author wants to win. Or worse, it'll just be a tie because whatever company owns the rights doesn't want one of their IP to seem less valuable than another. Either way, no amount of power scaling on Reddit is going to turn the tide of battle in your favor. So what's my point? What am I getting at here? Well, I think you should subscribe and drop a like. <laughs> to be honest, kind of nothing. If you enjoy power scaling and all that entails, if the process of debate brings you joy, then go for it. Who the hell am I to stop you? But I do think that we would all benefit from recognizing that the practice is pretty flawed, prone to absurd confirmation bias, and is really not worth taking super seriously or getting angry about. I also think it might do us some good to focus on the other things that make our favorite characters so cool. And when we do run into dick measuring territory, we consider whether a feat is actually representative of them, or if it's just happening for the sake of a cool scene, before we start whipping out the calculators and measuring tape. In short, have fun, but just know that I think you're a goofy goober. Then again, what do I know? I watch slice of life anime. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time to explain why Komi-san solos all of One Piece with her devastating conqueror's hockey. So one question I'm always asked. Who would win in a fight? Who would win in a fight if Galactus fought uh, the Hulk? Or if Thor fought Iron Man? And there's one answer to all of that. It's so simple. Anyone should know this. The person who'd win in a fight is the person that the scriptwriter wants to win. If I'm writing a story about the thing from the Fantastic Four. And he gets into a big fight with Spider-Man. And millions of people out there say, who would win? Well, it depends on who I want to win if I'm writing the script. If I want Spider-Man to win, he'll win. If I want the thing to win, he'll win. These are fictitious characters. The writer can do whatever he wants with them. So stop asking those bonehead questions, because I've had it with that.